I'm here this morning instead of Keith. Forrest is over here to attend to the screens. Twyla is at the organ. And all of this is because Keith had to take care of some important presbytery business this morning. I realize this is all different from what you expected when you came to church today, including no scripture inside your bulletin. When things are different from what we expect, when things change, we are called on to adjust. That's part of life. And certainly change can be upsetting. However, it is also true that change can be quite exciting. For example, next week we will welcome Grace's new music director, who just happens to be here this morning. Dennis, would you please stand? Thank you. That is a change that we are expecting and we will be happy to embrace. So it seemed to me that thinking about change would be an appropriate topic for today's message. And when I think of change, I immediately think of Jonah, because absolutely everyone in that story makes a change. This strange little story of Jonah is a two-part story. Part one is about flight. God has instructed Jonah to go to Nineveh, to call the people there to repent from their evil ways. But Jonah wanted nothing to do with that assignment, and so he literally runs as far and as fast as he can from Nineveh and from God. And he boards a ship. A great storm comes upon the sea, and the crew believes that the storm has been caused by someone on the ship. So Jonah steps forward, confessing that surely he is the cause of the storm, because actually he has just disobeyed God. So at his request, the crew toss him overboard. The storm subsides, and Jonah is rescued from the sea by being swallowed up by a giant fish. There in the belly of the big fish, Jonah wish it, promises to be obedient to God, at which point the fish spews Jonah out onto dry land. That part of the story we all know best. But there's much, much more to this story. So let's listen now to part two of Jonah, chapter three, verses one through 10 and four, one through 11. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time saying, get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city going a day's walk, and he cried out, Forty days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God, and they proclaimed a fast, and everyone great and small put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Then he had a proclamation made in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, no human being or animal, no herd or flock shall taste anything. They shall not feed, nor shall they drink water. Human beings and animals shall be covered with sackcloth, and they shall cry mightily to God. All shall turn from their evil ways and from the violence that is in their hands. Who knows? God may relent and change his mind. He may turn from his fierce anger so that we do not perish. And when God saw that they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarsus at the beginning, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out to the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, 
waiting to see what would become of the city. And the Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush, but when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, you are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 people who do not know their right hand from their left, and also many animals? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, just a few points of information about the text. When the citizens of Nineveh and the king put on sackcloth and ashes, that was a customary sign of repentance, a symbol of sadness, of mourning, regret, as well as humility before God. Regarding their evil ways, what exactly was so evil about them, this refers to the fact that they were pagans, meaning they worshiped an assortment of gods introduced by the Assyrians who overtook them. Nineveh was a Gentile city and therefore considered an enemy of Israel. Okay, now we're ready. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. We could rightfully expect this story to have a happy ending. After all, Jonah is given a second chance. He carries out God's commission to the people of Nineveh, the people there repent and change. God decides not to bring judgment upon them. And just when we would anticipate the narrator to proclaim that they all lived happily ever after, much to our surprise, we learn that Jonah isn't happy at all. In fact, he's so unhappy and so angry that he would rather be dead than alive. Why is Jonah so upset? After all, none of the other prophets even come close to this kind of success. Most of the prophets we know were totally written off as crazy or they were completely ignored. And then there was John the Baptist and we know what happened to him. Jonah is upset because this mortal enemy of Israel has at long last made it to the top of God's to be destroyed list. And he couldn't be happier about that. And now God is asking him to go there and warn them that if they don't turn from their pagan ways, God is going to destroy them. This assignment, this mission, God has given Jonah calls into question everything that Jonah holds to be true and sacrosanct as a Jew. It just doesn't seem fair. Imagine that conversation with God. What are you thinking, God? Why do you want me to do this? I thought we were your chosen people. Those peoples are pagans. They don't even know how to worship you or how to keep your laws. Lord, they are unclean. And you want me to warn them of your judgment? Why, Lord, they deserve your judgment. How can you offer them the same deliverance that you have given to us? So we can see why Jonah wants no part of this redemption thing. Besides, while Jonah stands there, still draining seawater from his ears, he knows firsthand of God's mercy, doubting that God would even do such a thing as destroy Nineveh, and so he sees no point in going there. The biblical commentators tell us that this little story is about Israel, Israel's reluctance to reach out to those outside the original covenant that was established with God. Therefore, Jonah represents Israel. The story is written to prompt Israel to open herself 
to a more comprehensive understanding about the magnitude of God's grace offered to all. And of course, this would call for a rather large change of heart for Israel toward her neighbors and her enemies, as well as a great challenge to their identity. Israel was perfectly satisfied with the covenant they had with God just the way it was, just the way it had always been. So Jonah is wondering, why do things have to change? My specific call to ministry for 20 years was as a pastor to congregations who were in transition. And every congregation I've served has affirmed something that we all know. And that is that the world that we all grew up in exists no more. While we were all busy rearing families and climbing corporate ladders, the world changed. But while the world was changing at a warp speed, the church did not change. As a result of this, the latest statistics tell us that for Presbyterians, two-thirds of our denomination's congregations now worship less than 100 on a weekly basis. Two-thirds. The church is smaller and older right now. But they add, we are not dying, we are reforming. And that's something we Presbyterians do know something about even something to celebrate. Why do things have to change, especially when we like them just the way they are? Why is it that God seems to always be asking us to do something we've never done before? And I hope that you will think about that question this week. Now you've heard me share this before from Reverend Michael Foss in his book, Power Surge, but it's worth repeating. How we have been the church is no longer effective. Further, the model of being church that we all grew up with has been focused on taking care of the membership. And he spells out the need for the church to move from that model to a model of discipleship. The discipleship model focuses on mission. In a nutshell, it means the church must turn its focus from inside to outside. Our General Assembly has shared that the decline that we have seen is because we Presbyterians do not do evangelism well. We do not seem to know how to share our faith with others. So here's an idea. Those blue shirts, if you haven't purchased one yet, I encourage you to do so. And then wear it. Wear it everywhere you go. And when someone asks you about the shirt, tell them about the wonderful church where you have the opportunity to learn God's word, to experience God's grace, and to participate in being the hands and feet of Christ in today's world. Tell them how your faith has made a difference in your life. The world has changed, and so must the church. Who could have imagined the multitude of things that we can do and the way our lives have changed because of our cell phones. They come with GPS systems, locators, alert systems that tell me that a storm is going to be in my house in seven minutes. They remind us of the meetings we're going to have, record health information, and here's the best thing. Here in Tampa Bay, I was literally present on Christmas morning to watch and communicate with my children, grandchildren, and great-grandchild as they opened their gifts in Seattle simply by calling up FaceTime on our phones. Is that not the most amazingly wonderful invention that we could never have imagined 20 years ago? And that's today. What will tomorrow bring? Some time ago, I was channel surfing and landed on a station that was featuring old science fiction films. At the time, The Blob was showing. Remember that one? It was followed by It Came From Beneath the Sea, which was a mutated octopus large enough to take to the bottom of the ocean a huge battleship. I was immediately fascinated with the low-tech scenery and decided to watch for a while just to see how it compared to what we consider frightening or grotesque today. The difference was laughable. 
Our grandchildren would think that the horror films of our day, The Thing, The Blob, It, Them, are pretty silly movies. Our evening news is more frightening than Dr. Strangelove because, well, the news is real. The world has changed, and so must the Church of Jesus Christ. We're no longer a nation unto ourselves. Like it or not, we are part of the global community that grows closer every day, and unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be growing any kinder. Like Jonah, we can try to run from it, or sit back waiting to see what happens, or we can do everything in our power to influence the character and the direction of this brave new world in which we find ourselves and to share the compassion and redemption we know through Jesus Christ. When the Pharisees pestered Jesus to give them a sign about the coming of the kingdom, Jesus refers them to this story of Jonah. Why did he do that? Simply put, Jonah was sent by God to Nineveh to save a city from their sinful ways, just as Jesus was sent to save the world from our sins. But because the Pharisees were expecting a different kind of Messiah, they didn't get it. They didn't recognize who he was. Maybe they didn't want to see the connection between Jonah and Jesus because they had absolutely no interest in changing the dynamics of their lives, their beliefs, their worship, or their traditions. Can you see how narrow their vision was? Jonah finally goes to Nineveh because he was grateful to God for, changing, for saving him, and he promised to be obedient. But we know his heart wasn't in the assignment because it was definitely going to change things. How difficult it was for him to accept that God could love those pagans as much as he loved Israel. Did this mean Israel wasn't God's favorite people anymore? Of course, we know it is not Jonah who caused the king and the people to repent and change, for the power to change one's heart is the work of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit isn't within our control. As incredible as it may seem to us, God is a collaborative God, a covenantal God, a God who wants to partner with us. And clearly it was God's desire for Jonah to play a role in this change of hearts that happened to the people in Nineveh. Perhaps partnering with us is God's way of teaching us. Perhaps God thought partnering with Jonah would help him to understand and accept the magnitude of his grace that is offered to all. When we place Jonah's story alongside the missionary lives of the disciples and Paul and the multitude of martyrs that followed, we can see it has always been God's desire for all nations and all generations to experience God's redeeming love. I believe the church is now and always has been called to play the role of Jonah to partner with God in sharing the news of redemption through Christ. But today we seem to be stuck in part one of the story. So as a particular congregation, where exactly in the story do you think we are? Are we still arguing with God about not wanting to go into unfamiliar territory to people we don't approve of, don't want to associate with, people we don't think deserve to be saved? Or like Jonah, do we think God doesn't need us to get the job done? Are we hiding in the hole of our churchships because we're afraid to do something we've never done before? Like, oh, I don't know, volunteering to be an usher. Are we stewing in the dark belly of the fish, wondering if this is the end of us as we look around and see no children in church today? Or do we find ourselves on dry land, wondering what has just happened to the church, and trying to understand why God continues to love us, continues to bless us, and continues to give us second chances? You know, we do talk a lot about how blessed we are. Well, we are, for sure. And we talk a lot about how church isn't the same as it used to be. But instead of trying to make it like it used to be, I pray that we will use our energy and our resources that we have been given to make church something that speaks to today's world, something that isn't yet. 
something that will be celebrated here 50 years from now. I believe God is not just calling us. I believe God is insisting that we move into part two of the story. That the church go into today's Nineveh-like world to carry the message of his amazing love and mercy for all to all. It's a holy mission. It's why the church exists. And because the world has changed, we must now find new ways to share the truth about God and Christ. We must be creating new ways to communicate, not just our love for Jesus Christ, but most especially his love for them. Ways that yesterday we never could have imagined. To be a viable church-like presence, we must constantly be assessing how effective we are. So what will that mean? What will it take? We will surely need to address the scheduling challenges and the spiritual needs of today's young families. We must adapt to the expectations of the younger and very tech-savvy population who will judge the content of our message by the method and the manner in which we deliver it. It will require us to focus on mission, not membership. And the heart of a successful congregation will need to be unabashedly caring and generous to people who are different from us and those who are in need of help. We must get the message to the surrounding community whom we don't know, children and their parents who probably will not appreciate our particular sense of decorum and who have absolutely no idea what the term narthex, chancel, gloria patri, or doxology means which is to say that we must learn to communicate in today's language. Our worship will need to be more experiential with videos and whatever else we can dream up that communicates to a younger, visually oriented generation who multitask every waking hour of their day. Maybe instead of bulletins, one day we'll just use our cell phones. We will need to develop relationships with our neighbors and other communities of faith and create a place where strangers experience a sense of belonging immediately. Jonah wasn't able to accept the grace that God offered to the people of Nineveh, but I'm betting we can. In fact, there are indicators that change is already underway here at Grace. You have state-of-the-art video screens up here and a 1974 hymnal in the pew. That's change. Letting go of the past isn't easy for sure, but it's the only way forward. There are 450 English translations of the Bible, and yet our children do not know that Jesus was a Jew. There is much work to be done, and we cannot assume that it's just going to happen by coming to church, nor can we expect that one or two or more pastors have enough clout or jokes or degrees or a to bring in youth and children so the church can return to how it once was. We must say goodbye to those days. And we must all take responsibility like we've never had to do before. That is discipleship. Yes, change is messy. And yes, it can be very disturbing. Of course, we could try to run the other way, but we'd be kidding ourselves to think that that would delay the coming changes. Or we can just get on with it knowing that as we go, God will be working his will through us, partnering with us, just like God did with Jonah, even if we too are not convinced of its merits and have absolutely no idea where it may lead. We love the church just the way it is, just the way it has always been. And Grace has had a really great run of 50 wonderful years. Only God knows what the next 50 years will look like. But we can be and we must be ready for whatever possibilities, whatever opportunities God chooses to place before us in the days and years ahead. Can I get an amen? Amen. 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 The world has changed and so must the church. This small little story of Jonah, often thought of as a children's story, calls for a very adult response. How will our story turn out? Year 51 is already underway. 
And with or without us, God will see to it that someone goes to Nineveh. So the question we must answer is this. If we aren't going where God is sending us, where in the world do we think we're going?